Good evening, everybody. Wasn't that a really wonderful time of worship? Thank you so much, worship team. So good. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Service One of SIBKL. My name is Miranda. I am one of the pastors here in this church. If you're not familiar with who I am, um, I'm the campus pastor, campus community. Um, I pastor the campus students of this church. So if you're a campus student here in this room, we want you, okay? Uh, just come to the front, say hello to us, and we would love to host you and be part of this family. Um, okay, I'm going to start my message, but I actually quite felt quite compelled to tell a joke. Should I do it? Should I tell the joke? Oh my gosh. Okay, since you'll say yes, you'll promise me you'll have to laugh, okay? Okay, um, I'm going to start like this. So what happened was that I was trying to figure out what intro, sh how, how should I start this sermon? I'm trying to figure out an intro and unfortunately, I had nothing. I had no exciting like, thing to say and all that until when I was standing there at the corner and I realized this one thing. So recently, just a couple of days ago, I was doom, doom scrolling on social media, you know, on, on Instagram basically. Anyone know what doom scrolling is, right? You're just lying down in bed, you know, chilling and trying to kill time, uh, you know. And, and I, was, I stumbled upon uh, this post uh, from the Drew Barrymore show. Anyone knows Drew Barrymore? She's an actress, right? If you shows your age, if you know who she is. Okay, so she actually had this show, the Drew Barrymore show, and she was interviewing this one person, and she said this, it's a man, and said to this man, I wonder if you could actually lift me up on your shoulders and do five squats with me on top of your shoulders. And this guy actually said, yeah, I, I can do it right now. So she actually asked her to actually climb on the sofa. And what he did was that he literally lifted her up and put her over the shoulder like this, like sideways. And he did like one, two, three, four, five, like super easy. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, this guy is strong. And then, lo and behold, today, when I was standing there, I realized that I, I'm actually dressing like him. Anyone wants to guess who this person is? Ah, oh, okay, someone said that, someone said The Rock, right? Anyone knows who The Rock is? The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, anyone? You know, I was like, oh, low-key embarrassed. I was talking to Ange. I was like, oh my God, I look like I'm, I dress like The Rock, you know? And I'm like, I think that's what social media does to you, right? Like you scroll and then you subconsciously actually felt like you want to dress like that strong man. Yeah. So maybe that was actually an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. How about that? I'm dressed like The Rock today, so hopefully um, you get stronger and stronger after you hear my message. As you can see, that's my title. So, um, okay, before I go there, um, you guys know where The Rock came from, right? He was from, uh, he started off as a wrestler, right? Wrestler, if you know that he started off as a wrestler means you are pretty old, I would say, or maybe like very super senior. And um, he loves saying this phrase, anyone wants to, you know, banter with me and try to give me a shot what he usually says when he's on a wrestling match. Sm yeah, what the rock is cooking. <laughs> okay, so today the rock from WWE is not going to cook. The Christ our rock is going to cook, amen? <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my joke. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start my sermon right now. Thanks for laughing. All right, come, let's pray. Father God, I just really want to pray and thank you for this evening. Um, thank you for the awesome intro. Uh, Lord, we believe, Lord Father, that you have a word in season, that you want to speak to our church and our community here even this evening. So God, I pray that you use me as your mouthpiece, and I pray, Lord Father, many people will be blessed by your word. In Jesus' most precious name, and everybody say... Amen. Okay. Okay. All right. So since, as you can see from the screen, my message today is titled, Stronger and Stronger. Everybody says, Stronger and Stronger? Stronger, stronger and Stronger. So this was actually, I, I was thinking what to title my sermon, right? And I was actually inspired by the theme of SIBKL this year. Anyone can give me a shout, what is the theme of our church in 2024? Three? Two, one. See, Pastor Chu, your people, whether they remember or not. Strong? Strong generations. Yes. Okay. It's not moving. 
So as you can see, I need to click this, but it's not moving. Can, can uh, media team help me with that? Okay, there you go. Strong church, strong generations. And this is so good. So as you can see, I'm going to be speaking about this word, strong. The theme of SIBKL's um, year this year is strong. So we have landed on 2 Samuel already, in case you are unaware. We are at 2 Samuel chapter 2 uh, to 4. So it's a pretty big chunk of verses there. It's about 83 verses. But let me just unpackage this for you that I'm not going to be reading the whole passage. But what I'll do here is that I'm going to pull out excerpts or maybe just one or two verses from uh, several chapters to actually share my point. Are you guys ready? Okay, really very good. Okay, I'm really very excited to preach ready. So as I was reading chapter 2 to 4, that one particular verse I felt was that one verse that kind of like encapsulated everything together. And that verse was none other than this verse right here. The war between the house of Saul. Come on, let's read it together. One, two, three. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger. Come on, everybody say again. Stronger and stronger. While the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So, when I was looking at this passage, what does the word strong mean? So, like every good Bible preacher, I need to actually go and find what is the original word, which is a Hebrew word of what strong here means. It essentially means royal power and it is loud. So, when you think about the word royalty, it essentially speaks about governance, something that controls maybe a group of body. It, it speaks about loudness, meaning whatever is loudest in your life is what governs you. There is authority over you, there is control over you, including, you know, like, there is also strength. When you hear the word strong, you're talking about numbers, you're talking about masses, you're talking about gathering of people together. And when you gather a group of people, you know the phrase in, in, in Ecclesiastes, you say a cord of three strands can never be easily broken. So when a mass of people come together, it is strong, it is loud. Imagine when I say, you know, SIBKL, Service One, give a big shout of praise to Jesus. Why don't we do that? It's loud. Amen? One, two, three. Shout of praise. Come on! There you go. So, that is the power of strength. Numbers, it is loud. So, when you look at this chapter here, or this phrase here, there are two camps. There are two houses. There is the house of David, and there is the house of Saul. And the house of David is stronger and stronger. The house of Saul is weaker and weaker. So, what, what has royal powerful, or power and it's loud in your life, is what governs you. The house of David represents the Spirit of God, and the house of Saul represents the Spirit and the flesh of the world. As an individual church, as a person, as a church as, at large, we ought to live lives that are strong in the Spirit. Amen? We want to be a church that is strong. Not strong just in the eyes of the world, but we want to be strong in spirit as well. So how do we do that? How do you know that you're growing stronger and stronger? And I have three points right here. How do you know you're growing stronger and stronger? The first point is uphold yourself to the Lord every time. Uphold yourself. And the second point is have an uncommon act of kindness. It's uncommon, okay? You know you're growing stronger and stronger when you actually give uncommon acts of kindness and the third one is, there is unity in the house. You guys ready for me to unpackage this? Good? Okay, let's go. So now, the first point here, uphold yourself to the Lord. In scripture here, in chapter 2, it says, In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. Then David asked again, Where shall I go? To Hebron. Then the Lord answered, so David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. So the key word here is, David constantly inquires of the Lord. You will hear this phrase many, many times. If you have been following us in our Samuel series, you would have noticed that this phrase constantly appears when David is 
is, you know, in refuge or he's a fugitive. And then the word always comes out, David inquired of the Lord. Essentially, what he's saying here is that he's always in alignment with God. He is always obedient towards the Lord. And because he always upholds himself to the Lord, he's always in step with the Lord. But in contrary, the house of Saul, Saul carries a spirit of rebellion, that he doesn't follow the steps of the Lord, and the Spirit of God actually left him. This was in 1 Samuel, I believe, in chapter 16. So here when you look at David's life, when God says go, then only he go. When God says wait, he will wait. So David, his story was really very interesting, right? You know, he was actually anointed as a king when he was 13 to 14 years old. Samuel was the one that anointed him, if you've been following our series. So actually, he already knew the promises of God since he was a, he was a teenager. But actually, this whole promise that he had in his life was not fulfilled until many, many, many years later. That he, he 15 years old, he, he killed Goliath, he became like an overnight sensation, he became famous. Then after that, seven years of his life, it was great. Then after that, you know, Saul got jealous, and seven years later, his life was a living hell. Then after that, you know, like... He was a fugitive for another eight years and he kept running and running and running. That was his life. But one thing that David actually learned in that sort of posture is that it's not about me. It is always about God's will, God's way, and God's timing. That is the posture of David. David always inquired of the Lord. You know, I, I just felt like I wanted to share this. You know, like the beauty and the power and the strength that David had was that waiting is an act of a renewing of strength for him. Waiting is an act of renewing of strength. And where do I see that? We can find it actually in another passage in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I want to show you this. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3 to 6, this was during the time when David was still running as a fugitive, I'm just going to summarize this. And when he arrived at Ziglag, he realized that, you know, the, the whole city and the whole town was burned with fire and his wives, his son, his children was all taken captive. They were all gone. And then David and his people all raised up their voice because they were so, so frustrated. They were disappointed. All sorts of messy emotions. They wept and they even wept until they had no more strength to weep. But take this here. David's two wives were gone, as you can see, and people were going to stone, you know, spoke of stoning him because of all the people who felt the bitterness in their soul, even each his, son, his sons and daughters. But get this at the, the final point at the bottom there. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Wow. That caught my attention. At the time, in 1 Samuel, David lost everything. And you know, in a moment like this, maybe some of you can actually relate that you've lost everything. And the first thing that you would think of, especially when people are running after you, you have you've lost everything, the first thing you would probably think of is you want to talk to God and say, God, what do I do now? That's a very common phrase that we always scream and ask God like, how, oh God, you know, how? And I was reading this and it caught my attention that the Holy Spirit gave me this revelation that David did not ask God, what do, I, what do I do now? What David did was that he strengthened himself. And what he did was he actually went and be with the Lord. He strengthened himself by worshipping. He strengthened himself by, you know, feeding himself with the Word. You know, he strengthened himself by upholding himself to the Lord first. Because renewing your strength it's a prerequisite to receiving direction from God. Why is that? If you are not upholding yourself to the Lord, even if God screams to your ears, uh, your spiritual antenna is already broken because you have never been in sync with the Lord. How are you going to hear from the Lord? Because your receptors to hear from God are closed. You need to always receive direction and strategy from the Lord when not just by receiving that, but you need to strengthen yourself first. Wow. You know, um, I was looking at the, the flip side of it here. 
This is Saul, the house of Saul. This was in chapter 28 in 1 Samuel. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, same posture, but the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Saul's heart was the total opposite. It is not strengthened by the Lord. He has slipped away and he has gone weaker and weaker. Friends, have you been upholding yourself to the Lord and have you been strengthening yourself in the Lord or not? Are you growing stronger and stronger or are you growing weaker and weaker? Church, why do you think that God did not answer Saul? He was at his worst place in his life, right? And this was a revelation that I had. God wants to feed you before He can lead you. He wants to feed you spiritually first. He wants you to be, you know, in communion with Him first. You need to eat and consume His Word to be in alignment with Him, to be in His presence before you want to go, God, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? If you don't uphold yourself to the Lord, your, He's not your source of strength. He's going to become your supplement to your strategy. He becomes someone that you use, not someone that you depend on. Who is God to you? You know, after David lost everything, he didn't come to God with a strategy. He came to God for strength. And this is my encouragement to, to someone here. You need to draw strength from God. Amen? He wants to feed you before He can lead you. What does, what does strengthening yourself in the Lord look like? It's, it can look like just you locking yourself in your room and worshipping Him, crying out to Him, singing your favourite worship song, and let the worship song just fill you, fill you with His Word, study His Word. You know, in moments like this, I realise that in moments where I feel directionless, the moment where I actually just put all these issues aside and just lay at His feet and just cry out to Him, these are moments when I would refresh myself and be renewed and receive fresh revelation from God after my strengthening. And I feel I just want to encourage someone here today. Turn your desperation into a devotion. Turn your panic, if you're panic, panicking over something right now, turn your panic into a passion for His presence. Amen? Are you guys receiving the word today? It's a good word so far. So the first one, how do you know that you are growing stronger and stronger is when you uphold yourself to the Lord. And the second one here is you will exemplify an uncommon act of kindness. You know when you're constantly renewed in your strength and you're strong in the Lord, it, that means uh, your tank is not empty. There is something that is overflowing in you and it, is it will be reflected through your actions when you are strong. You become, un you become someone who is uncommon. You know, the, the world today is very common. But when you're in the presence of God, when you are filled and you're strengthened by the Lord, you are uncommon by giving acts of kindness, even especially to those who do not deserve it. Because it gives you a supernatural and uncommon kind of strength to revive others. And, and we can see this here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, from verse 11 to 13. This is a story here where he lost everything and what he did, uh, what, what David did was he prayed and asked the Lord. David inquired of the Lord and then shortly after, just a few, few verses later, he decided to move based on the instructions of the Lord and then they found an Egyptian in the open country and he brought him to David. And then what David did was that, you know, he gave him bread to eat he gave him water, he gave him drinks, he even gave him cakes, he gave him like, you know, figs and all that, and even two clusters of raisin. And when he had eaten, look at what happened to the Egyptian. His spirit was revived, for he had not eaten for days. And if you know this story about the Egyptian here, is that the Egyptian was actually from the enemy side, the Amalekites. And because he actually strengthened this person out of his uncommon acts of kindness, in the end, this was the person that led him 
to the Amalekites and gave him clues how to actually recover what he had lost. How powerful is that? You know, when you have an uncommon act of kindness, you never know who you help and who this, what this gesture would do that would lead you to your restoration and to your redemption. Amen? Wow, so powerful. And there's this one other thing that David actually did was this story here. You know, um, in 2 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet and he was five years old. And when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, his nurse picked him up, fled, but, you know, as he was hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. And this person's name is Mephibosheth. So this person is actually the son of Jonathan. And why this particular verse is like so random, you know, kind of like sticking out like a sore thumb even in 2 Samuel chapter 4? Because there is actually a story after this. So Mephibosheth was five and he was crippled. And obviously, in those moments in chapter 4, David eventually took the reins of um, the, seven, the, the 12 tribes of, Jude, uh, uh, tribes of Israel, uh, apart from Judah and the 11 tribes as well, and he became king. And he became someone who is of power. And of course, because Mephibosheth was part of the other side of the camp, which is, um, uh, you know, the house of Saul, and he was left to the slums. You know, his life was shattered. But get this, this story. You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, what happened was that King David, at the time when he has already become a king, he had such a wonderful posture that because he had an overflow of strength, of love to give, what he did was he actually asked, is there any other descendants left in the house of Saul that I can bless? Wow, imagine this used to be your enemy, you know, that tried to chase after you. He could have almost killed you, but he had such an uncommon act of kindness that he still want to bless his enemy's child. And this is the story. It says, For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Wow. He had so much capacity of generosity because of the tank that was filled and strengthened by the Lord. He lends strength to the poor. Friends, are you strong? And if you want to know if you're strong, it is when you actually have the strength to give to the poor. Amen? You know, as I was looking at this passage, it reminded me of an unusual, uncommon type of leadership. You know, when you are a leader, you carry a certain kind of strength. Amen? You know, the kingdom of world of the world, which is the house of Saul, tells you that when you are strong, you can exert all the, powerful, the power that you want. You can exert your authority in strength. You can abuse because it is your right because you hold the title. And in the kingdom of heaven, the house of David, when you are strong, you are called to lend strength to the poor. And in other words, the heavenly kingdom in David, of, of the house of David, it says, to be great, you must be the least. The one who rules is the one who serves. Come on, let's say it together. The one who rules is the one who serves. That, amen, that is the house of David, the heavenly kingdom. And the worldly kingdom, which is the house of Saul, it says to be great, you must become first. The one who rules is the one being served. That is what the world says, right? You know, it's, it's the norm out there. There's nothing special about it. It's common. It's common, right? It's a common standard. But must we live in this common standard? I want to share this experience. You know, I was, I was having a chat with one of my friends and um, just, just, just last night, actually, and she was telling me this. Hey, Miranda, you know, uh, my, my colleague actually throw in the, throw in the, the uh, resignation today, you know. Then I asked, hey, why? So what happened? Like, and then she said, oh, because of... Um, my boss, right, had a shouting match with her. And what happened was that um, the boss actually shamed her in public because of mistakes that she did. It's like, I mean, I don't, want to, I don't know the exact words that she used, but just imagine with me, it's like, wow, you are, you are so foolish, good for nothing, why you always make mistakes, those kind of words. And sometimes even swear words come out and things like that. 
And I believe at the time, what happened was that the colleague couldn't take it anymore and the colleague actually started shouting back. And it was so bad that in the end, the next day she just threw in her letter and said, I'm done. And um, she, she was telling me this story and I actually asked her like, uh, don't, don't mind me asking like, is your boss usually like this? And she said, yeah, lor, like she's quite emotional one. Like she, whenever she gets frustrated, she doesn't solve problems. These are her exact words. She doesn't solve problems, but she just acts out in emotions and she just shouts, get angry and things like that. And um, wow, it got me thinking. And because she said this, you know, like, I don't know, leh, I don't know whether, um, you know, like, I want to, I don't know how long I want to stay here because she's not the kind of leader I want to follow. You know, like, I feel that she's not really a leader, she's just my boss. And um, this is, if I could say it in, in um, a very famous leadership guru term, I believe it was John C. Maxwell, this person, I believe, was carrying a positional kind of leadership because you lead in power, in strength, based on your title. People follow you because they have to. No choice, ma, because you're the manager. So her boss was exercising her strength and her power through her title, but she wasn't leading in influence. You know, in the flip side of things, in the eyes of the kingdom of God, what kind of leadership we need to exemplify? It is what we call the one right at the top of the scale, which is the pinnacle leadership. Pinnacle leadership means people follow you for who you are and what you represent. A good leader would have somewhat an uncommon kind of grace for the kindness and the graciousness for the people that they lead. You know, sometimes as young people, we do make mistakes. Just want to speak to the more experienced one here in the room, right? We want to learn, and sometimes we may not be as quick, or we, we just want to be guided. And I pray that with all your wealth and experience, that you would have that uncommon grace, that uncommon act of kindness, if I'm speaking someone to someone in this room today, to teach, to guide, and be patient. Because in this world, people force their way through. In this world, people don't have the patience to teach. But I pray that the kind of leadership that is, that is formed and built even in the house of God would be so different. Amen? Because we do not lead um, in the strength of the world, but we lead in the capacity that shows grace in kindness. Church, if you're in the position of strength, I believe many of us, all of us here, have actually a role. You have a title. Whether you, you wear a certain kind of hat, you know, either you're a father, you're a mother, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a manager, you're an owner of a business, you're a cell leader, you're a captain of a team, maybe you're a leader in a group assignment, you're president of a club, you're a board member somewhere, or maybe you could be just someone's PA, personal assistant, you're an admin assistant. That position holds power, can I say that? The world defines strength very differently. Church, can I ask us this very poignant question? Does the world lead us or do we lead the world? Oftentimes we say this, right? Hey, we need to learn from the gurus out there the corporate people, so, so good, you know. Their leadership skills are so amazing. We need to learn from the gurus, the, the technical experts, all these things from the people out there. The top standards of leadership are out there. But I want to challenge our thought for a moment here. People outside say, do like that one, ma. So this is acceptable, lah. But can we invert that truth for a moment? It is actually the church that should set the standard, Amen. Because the standard of leadership in the eyes of God's word is stewardship. And it is set by the Bible. And that is the ultimate truth and example that we ought to follow. Let me share with you this truth. The higher we go, the lower we ought to go. The greatest example that shows this is the example of Jesus Christ. This season, we are actually going through the season of Lent, amen? That we are observing this whole month of Lent, where we will, which will lead us towards Passion Week and Good Friday and Easter. You know, towards Passion Week, what Jesus did, even though he had all the strength, 
all the power that he had, but he exemplified an uncommon act of kindness the night before he died. He actually was at the upper room and he actually spent time with his 12 disciples. And what did he do there? Anyone can tell me. He bent down and washed his disciples' feet. The higher we go, the lower we ought to go. Perhaps the greatest indicator of our strength is how we handle authority, power, and influence. The Word of God says the first shall be the last and the last shall be the first. To be stronger and stronger is to be more and more humble, amen? And un have an uncommon act of kindness to give to others. Serve others. Serve and give life to people. And that is the mark of growing stronger and stronger. Come on, everybody say, stronger and stronger. Stronger. You guys doing good so far? Yes? You guys ready for the third point? Very good. Okay. So the third one, how do you know you're growing stronger and stronger? There is unity in the house. You know you grow stronger and stronger when there is unity. The opposite of what makes you weaker and weaker is when there is disunity. You know, no, you know, no surprise there. When there is disunity in the house, and this was actually reflected very evidently in the house of Saul. So in the house of Saul here, during the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine named Rizpah, daughter of Aya, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Well, let me just unpackage this for a bit because... What happened here was that Ishbosheth is actually the king that was appointed by Abner to rule, uh, to, to be the king over the 11 tribes apart from Judah. And I believe in this story, Abner was actually the one that is in power. He was the, the, um, the commander in chief towards um, King Saul. But now King Saul is actually dead. He, he passed away already. So the person that was actually kind of like making the decisions and stuff like that, even though Ishbosheth is the king, is actually Abner. He was strengthening himself, as you can see. And in those days, if you want to strengthen your position, it is actually a political move that you need to do, which is to actually show that you're in power. I want control. I want to claim a property. What they do in those times, which is kind of like that, is that they sleep with a woman. And this, they will sleep with the, the woman who is actually um, from your opposition side something like that, to show power. And that was what was believed that Abner did. And Ishbosheth was really very upset because Ishbosheth is actually King Saul's son. And he was, I believe, because he felt threatened because now that his, his father is dead and he's actually the king. Ma. But this Abner here is strengthening himself, you know. And he was threatened and he was trying to find fault with Abner and he wanted to fight with him. And because he's actually a really weak person, I don't think he's a warrior. He was probably just like a politician per se. He doesn't go out for fights and all that. And he was merely just a puppet to Abner. And when he accused Abner of that, Abner got really very angry. And basically what happened was that there is more and more infighting happen in the house of Saul. And when infighting happens at the top leadership, in this case, this is the general, the general of the army, and the king, there is infighting at the top. What happens here is that, that, you know, when there is fights happening at the top, everything rises and falls from leadership. Amen? There is a political struggle. There is selfish ambition, a lust in position, a lust of power, and whatever the case that may be, what you will inherit inevitably is destruction. Because it says here in the Word, you know, in, in the book of James, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find this order, this unity, and every evil practice. When the leader fights and are disunited, the house gets weaker and weaker because everything rises and falls on leadership. You know, just yesterday, Pastor Chu was sharing with us, with the pastors, 
um, you know, as leaders, we need to be synchronized. I really like that. Synchronized. Be a pacemaker for God. And I really like why he always says this. You can disagree, but don't disengage. I was reminded of this game that we play in tally matches. Anyone played this before? <laughs> right? In tally matches, uh, your legs are actually tied together. Some, sometimes we play like three legged, right? Three, uh, just two person, three legged. But I really like this one because this was actually a group of people. And I remember last time we actually played this before. And so look at this picture here. When you are bound together, actually, right, you're all on the same team. Friends, are you in the same team? Who are you fighting with? Think about it. Are they from your team one? If you're fighting with someone from your team, take a step back and reflect. Hold on to each other. Count together. Move together. One, two, one, two. You need to be in sync. Imagine if someone decides to just, I don't want to follow the one, I want to be two first. Everybody falls. Right? Because imagine if one person decides to break the momentum and not move. One person just say, I don't want, I want to stand here, I like it here. But actually the finishing line is there. What's going to happen is that everybody loses. Right? Nobody wins. When there is unity, there is strength. Because unity builds strength. Everybody say this, unity, unity. builds strength. Is there unity in your house today? And when I mean house, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean your workplace. Is there unity in your workplace? Think about it. Is there unity in your home? Husband and wife, are you in sync? Is there unity in your organization? Is there unity in your ministry? Is there unity in the people group that you're leading? Is there unity in your cell groups? Are you in sync with each other? Are you pacing together? Are you aligned? When was the last time you spoke about your vision and mission to your people? Maybe it's time for your next town hall meeting. That's my hint to you. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit telling you. Husband and wives, do you share the same directions? Do you share the same values? Are you talking? Do you remember your vows? Leaders of companies, are your subordinates aware of where you're going? When was the last time you downloaded your directions and synced them together with you? If you're a co-worker, do you believe in the vision and the values that your organization holds? What about your community groups, ministry leaders, cell groups? When was the last time you had your call meeting? Hopefully not six months ago. Just somebody snickering, laughing right? Have you been in sync with each other? How do you go in sync? We need to communicate. Can I share something about my own journey? I love sharing my own stories because it's in moments like this that I grow and learn the most. I want to talk about our own house. Is that okay? S-I-V-K-L. Our own house. I want to qualify here that SIBKL is not a perfect church, right? Pastor Chu, it's not perfect. You know, our church is far from perfect. You know, there's this phrase here that I heard from the very first few sermons that I set foot in SIBKL. And I was observing when I first came and looking very judgmentally because I was looking for a church to settle in when I first came back from Australia. I can't help but kept comparing churches in Malaysia and Australia. I was like, well, Australia got like that, like that. Then here, why Malaysia like that, like that? You know, um, guilty as charged. I do that a lot. And when I set foot in SIBKL for the first time, I did the same. I was judging a lot of things. How come got people talk to me or not? All these kind of things, you know. Um, praise the Lord. Our ambassadors are doing fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Our ushers and all that as well. You know, um, you know it's, the ministry has grown so much and the, the ushers are amazing. The leaders are amazing and all that. I mean, but with that said, we are still not perfect. And I remembered when I was sitting in, in the sanctuary, exactly this sanctuary, and I believe this was the second time I was attending SIBKL, and this great preacher, whose name is <coughs> Pastor Chu, actually shared this. If you are looking for a perfect church, 
go and look elsewhere. Because when you step into this church, you make the church imperfect. <laughs> Truth bomb! Wow! Okay, so, wow, that was the first time I sat foot in a church and I got slapped in the face. I was like, wow, I like this church eh. Sometimes it's good, right? When the word is a double-edged sword to you and it slaps you in the face. Come on, church, I feel like if you're being slapped here today, anyone here feel slapped? You know, I hope so. <laughs> that you're awake, you know, like you are actually, you know, being, you know, challenged and growing. You know, the first, first few times I was slapped already, right? I was so challenged and it reminded me that, yes, I am in a church and the church is for the imperfect. And I want to share this one story about an imperfect incident that actually happened through me and maybe the journey that I was in. So as most of you know, just now as I introduce myself, I'm currently leading um, the campus community in SIBKL. Hi, guys. Yeah. And um, the campus ministry in SIBKL um, went through a few transitions. And, uh, in, you know, two years ago, um, there was a transition in leadership. That's what happened. And the transition was messy. And actually, to be honest, transitions are all messy, right? This is not an exception. It was complicated. This was in April 2022. Many leaders, what happened was that when, when the previous leaders stepped out, many leaders in the campus ministry stepped down as well. People were tired. I'm not going to even hide the facts. Um, some of them moved on. Some dropped out of even church. Um, it was honestly a really painful sight to observe as a, as a shepherd in this house, as a leader in this house. And those who actually stayed had a lot of mixed emotions in the ministry. It was not easy to pastor that group of people. Um, there was, of course, a very, you know, great need of a shepherd and a lot of pastoral care was actually needed um, to step in to care for the well-being of the campus students. And um, I was, lo and behold, given the opportunity, if I can say that, to actually pastor this group of people. It was honestly, a, I don't know what to do because I've never led a campus ministry before. It was honestly a really rough start because we, had, we started from scratch. We had no leaders. And um, actually, some leaders did stay, but if I could count with one hand, it was less than five. And um, there was a great need. I honestly did not know what to do. And what I did was that I felt that the first thing I needed to do was pray. The first thing I needed to do was seek the Lord. And that was what I did. And if I could actually just say this, you know, I chose at that time, that time I didn't know that was the word, to strengthen myself in the Lord instead of asking for a direction first. You know, that time, the very song that, that appears very, very often in my Spotify list was actually Make Room. You know, the song Make Room, um, if, if, for those of you who have been long enough since YAC days, we sing it almost every week. It was insane. Like, if I look at my top, you know, like, um, the, the song of the year for my 2022 Spotify list, right, was actually Make Room. I should check. It was quite funny. I was like, oh, wow. I sang so, that song so much that I realized that that was actually my devotion out of my desperation, that I really needed a direction. And it was through that that I made that decision together with a small group of us that I went to the young adults because at that time I was a young adults leader and we went to the, the YA night and actually made a call and said that, you know, this is what's happening to our campus ministry and we need help and we need to come together to make campus great again, if I can say that. <laughs> yeah. And, and when I made that call, honestly, I didn't know who would respond. And I told myself, honestly, if got three or four or five people, it's better than none. And I'll work with who I have. And I was so pleasantly surprised that almost more than 15 people in YA said yes. And this is actually the group. Um, uh, but they are... This was 2022. Um, these were all the original leaders of YA campus. That was what we were called at the time. And we were actually growing in a very different kind of strength because campus was being lent a different kind of strength from YA. And I was just so thankful and so honoured 
because it was so interesting when I was looking at this picture here, right? This girl down here, oops, this, this, this girl down here in, um, I don't know how to point, but that's fine. I think this one, yeah, that's Michelle right there. And I remember at that time, she was, uh, she was on, a, on a sabbatical. And I actually asked her if she could actually come on board to be a casual worker to actually kickstart campus with me. And she did. She spent a good more than six months working in church with a very, just like, with just a very small love offering. And she set up all the systems in place, how to take attendance. We were all cracking our head how to actually lead this ministry without leaders. And we survived, if I can say that. We survived. You know, we, we made it. We did whatever we could. And what I really valued at that time was that because majority of the leaders, about maybe 70% or so, were actually young adults. And they all came in because they were all one at heart to really want to see campus grow and be great again. And I just really want to honour all these people. I'm just so thankful. Some of you are actually sitting here in front. They are actually here. I don't want to embarrass you, but they are here. Thank you so much for really being united as one. You know, we are united as one and we really want to see campus rise and grow. And of course, like, even so powerfully, we had our first camp together. 2023, we had one camp. That is so amazing, right? You know, I felt like the, the name of the camp itself speaks for itself, you know. We, were, we had our first combined campus and young adults camp. The camp was truly so prophetic because the word that represented our, our camp theme was actually Ephesians 4, verse 4 to 6. If you look around, someone with a shirt one, right? The verse is right behind their t-shirts behind. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. I like that verse because it says, make every effort. It doesn't just happen, one, you know. It takes effort to be united. It takes effort to be united in spirit, in one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, one God, Father of all. The Father in heaven ought to encapsulate and hold this group together as one. And of course, we had, you know, they were journeying alongside with us for almost a year and a half, I think, right, Audrey? About one year, maybe about one year. And we felt at the time was that there needs to be another rebirth, another transition. So we had, we decided to call for a leader's, kind of like a potential leader's retreat. This actually happened sometime in August, you know, right here, campus leader's retreat. This was in August. Um, they, they were all like people that we just felt like we have a vision to share. We really want to see campus grow to get out from a stroller, being pushed by YAs, if I can say that, to get out of that stroller and start walking. And we felt that it was time. And when we came together, about 10 YAs came. I know some of you are here. They came alongside us. And in fact, the camp commander was Edward, right? Hi, Edward. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And um, we came together to pull together a retreat in less than, how long are you now? Like less than two months or something like that. And when we came together, we casted a vision, we shared all we want to see is campus having its new rebirth, its new identity, its new purpose, and its new vision. And come October 2023, campus community was born. And campus community was born in October 2023 with new sets of leaders. You know, the, the YAs have kind of, if I can say, like, I don't want to use retired, but refired and move back to their YAs, right? <laughs> they moved, moved to their YAs and continued to build that space. And it has been five months. You know, God has been so, so good to us. You know, as of now, you know, when we first started off, we had about 50 people, I think, in October. And as of today, as we were looking at just the last couple of weeks where we gathered, we are now kind of like growing steadily at about 100 over people which is about twice the size of where we first started. All glory to God. And friends, I just want to say this, you know, it's not about the numbers, it's not about the size, it is about the strength of your roots, the strength of your foundation, whether you are united as one. Right there, you know, all these people in campus community, I just really want to honour all of you. It's been just five months, and everyone is just so excited to meet people in circles. We talk about it all the time. We don't just sit in rows, you know, like in pews like this. We sit in rows and we look at people's backs. 
but we love sitting in circles because when you sit in circles, we face each other, we have proper conversations, we connect, we create a space for people to belong, and we have a heart to really want to commune with each other so that we can connect in Christ. And because of that, we really want to have raw, real conversations about Christ. And these are things that we believe in. And I really want to just honour the campus community here for really walking in sync together in the last five months. And I don't take credit for this because I really want to believe that it is a team effort. That alongside not just me, not just campus, it was also the YAs. Thank you so much, YAs, for holding our hand and journeying alongside with us and really, really exemplifying the posture of being one, to be united in one house. And because of that, you know, I think we are now big babies now, maybe toddlers. We decided that this year, we want to have our own camp. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, come 31st May, 3rd, 3rd June, I said it right, 3rd June, right? 3rd June, we are having our very first campus camp. Um, we are not looking for numbers, like I say, we are limiting it to maybe about 150 people and see how it goes. So spaces are limited. If you are a campus student or if you know someone who is from the campus community, feel free to come and join us. I'm going to roll this video. I, I, maybe some of you have seen it already, but a lot of you probably have not. And I'm going to show you the short promo video that the team actually put together. Okay, over to you, media team. We're going to Legacy Camp and we want you there! This year, we are having our first campus community camp, Legacy Camp. Hey, bro! So if you're a campus student, we want you there! It's going to be four days, three nights of fun games, sharing with guest speakers, food, and most importantly, community. Hey! Most importantly, encountering God together. See you today for 31st May to 1st June. You don't want to miss out. And if you forget, you can check out our Instagram page for the latest updates. See you there! That is campus right there. So after five months, we felt that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to come together as one, as a community once, once again, to really come together to build a long-lasting legacy united as one house. Amen? All right. So, you know, honestly, looking back on this journey, it's been maybe just almost two years. You know, whatever the enemy meant for bad, God, can turn it around for good. And strength starts from upholding ourselves in the Lord, showing an uncommon act of kindness, that was what the YAs did, to serve others in love. And where there is unity, God will command its blessings. I just really want to honour this very special group of people. I wish they are here. This is actually your next-gen pastors. Um, you know, there's Pastor Isaac, you know, he's actually away for, I think, a young family's camp, Pastor Kim, and uh, Pastor, you know, they're all busy, you know, they're not here, and I, because they are, they are actually um, walking in step, in sync to build the generations. Pastor Sean is away with Narrow Street, and they are actually having a leaders camp, I believe, in Port Dixon as well, and then um, Pastor Jeremy is away in the slums of Philippines, was it? Philippines, right? Yeah, in the slums of Philippines, trying to actually... On, you know, like minister to the children and all that. You know, they're not here. But in, I just really want to say this. You know, like we're not perfect, perfect. We are far from perfect. But you know, one thing I really appreciate about being with them is that we meet once every two weeks and we come together to really talk about how we can build the next gen together. And I feel that, you know, even though we may disagree sometimes, but we don't disengage. disengage. We are not perfect but we are for each other. We want to be united in the front because we want to walk in step in the mission that God has given to us in SIBKL, which is to go to grow disciples across generations. Friends, transition can be messy. It's complicated. You know, in this scripture here, David was also in transition to become king. It was messy. Blood was shed you know, um, people that was infighting. You know, a lot of stuff happened. It all happens in scripture. It's real life stuff. And transition is messy even in real life here, in church. 
transition that I went through with campus or we went through as campus was messy as well. But God can turn it around for good when our eyes are fixed on that one thing, which is God Himself. Uphold yourself to the Lord. Uphold yourself. Have an uncommon act of kindness and then be united in your house. In our church, we all know it is, it's an open secret or not even a secret at all. This year, there will be a major transition that will take place in SIBKL because there will be a change of leadership but we will have new senior pastors. It will get messy. Can I say that? Some people will be maybe um, have mixed emotions. It will happen. I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. But in reality, I pray that all of us will still walk in step, in sync, and follow the pace of our leader, whoever the Lord has appointed. He is the one that God has anointed. Amen. And I pray that this will be the heartbeat of this house. So how do you know that you have grown stronger and stronger? Uphold yourself to the Lord. Come on, let's say it together. Uphold yourself to the Lord. Uncommon act of kindness and unity in the house. Uphold, uncommon and unity. Three words. Come on. Let's just pray together right now. Father God, we just really want to pray and thank you so much for your word. I know that this is your word in season. Your timing is always perfect. You always pick the right words in season to speak to us, even as a body of Christ. And God, I pray and I believe that you're speaking to someone here in this room, that you're calling this person. Don't ask me what to do. Don't ask me for strategy, but draw from your source of strength. Draw from me. Lock yourself in the room find a place to even be with Him. You know, whip up your favourite worship song and sit at His feet to strengthen yourself once again. Strengthen yourself in Him. That's where you can be in sync with the Holy Spirit and He will lead you in your next strategy. That is a word for someone here this evening. And for some of you here, if that is you, I, I want to invite you to come forward and our leaders, our pastors will pray for you feel dry, you're waiting, you are waiting for a breakthrough, you want to draw strength from God, come forward and we're going to pray for you. And we pray that the Lord will give you that direction that you need. The second group of people that I want to pray for is that you're a person of influence. You lead people. God is calling you to have an extra uncommon act of kindness to your people. Maybe you have not been very nice, I mean, I don't, want, I don't know what word to use, but you know yourself. But the Lord says, if you want to grow stronger, the higher you go, the lower you ought to go. Humble yourself and He will grow you from strength to strength. The third group of people that I want to pray for, that there is some form of disunity in your house, whether it's at your work, maybe there's conflict between husbands and wives at home, conflicts between parents and children there is some form of disunity you want the Lord to come and align and intervene and give you strength I want to open the altar for you as well to come forward and to be prayed for the third group the fourth group of people actually you heard this story for the very first time this story about Jesus he's the greatest example of a leader he carried a different kind of strength that despite you not deserving it, that He still took your sins, He bore your shame and He brought everything to the cross. You are of value to Him. I want to say this to someone here in this room. If you ever feel that you're worthless, I want you to know that Jesus says you are of value and I bought you with a price because I carry a different kind of strength and he wants you to receive him as his Lord and Savior 